And hello, we're live on YouTube. Uh, hello to anybody out there in YouTube land. Uh, I'm not too sure how many people we've got with us. And it might be just myself at the moment. Oh, uh, we'll see. This might be a very, very short episode. If there's anybody out there, say hello. And um, we're just following on from uh, tonight's um, video on the Ixian technology. And uh, as part of our look at uh, in-depth look at the evolution of machinery within um, Frank Herbert's Dune universe. So I'm sure somebody will be there hopefully in a second. <laughs> and in the meantime, I'll get some fluids. <clears throat> So I think we're not due to be on live for a couple of minutes, but I think there's maybe a couple of people here now. So hello to anybody joining us. and uh, Welcome very much to the station. Um, how are you all doing tonight? Give it, can you all hear me? If uh, Could somebody give us a wee yes, we can hear you or no? <laughs> that would be appreciated. Where's John? Does not can hear you very well? Babs, hello, Babs. And hello, John. Thank you very much, guys. Loud and clear. Hello and good evening to you or possibly a good afternoon where you're at, folks. Um, I think we've got a few people from around the world as so, well. Uh, just good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. So hello, and uh, as usual, we'll take some of your questions. Um, I've got a few wee things for you this evening as well, just just because we were talking about a few bits and pieces that, that came up yesterday. But um, I hope you've enjoyed the episode. It, it, it uh, starts to get into the, the, the I suppose, diving really into the June uh, part of things here with the PhD. So it's we do a lot of setting up and um, <clears throat> I suppose the first five videos almost is, a, is like a 20,000 word introduction into Frank Herbert June and, and, and when and where he was writing. And so as we get going with each of these chapters, we, we do kind of, um, I, I did separate out elements of my literary biography for each chapter to give you a kind of good introduction to each topic and set, set up your knowledge really um, so that we we really do show you the uh, the evolutionary argument that's going on in um, Victorian society. And it's very different than often the narrative that's portrayed today, that there, there is more than one idea of evolution. And um, I, I wanted actually to, to answer a question because somebody asked me, and I don't know what you think about this, but I have, I've done a wee bit of work on it. And I, I was, it was about when did Frank Herbert read Erewhon? And I assumed, and I, I incorrectly, by the way, I think the way my memory works sometimes was that I assumed it was part of that body of literature that we talked about, that uh, Finn de Siegel fiction, that he probably would make sense that he would have read as a young person because it's the kind of fiction that's popular and that's around. But um, it, was to do with, it was to do with how deceptive Frank Herbert can be about where he gets his information or his sources. And I actually believe that he didn't read Erewhon in his youth now. And, and I, I think just kicking in on my head, there, there are footnotes on this in the um, in, in these videos uh, to do with this. And you'll encounter this bit when we talk about the definition, Frank's definition of um, <clears throat> ecology that uh, Liat Kynes presents in June. And um, if basically when researching this, I think that there's a certain something to do with really Frank not acknowledging either work. But um, the research I did, and if I could just bear with me one second, uh, this, this is a Paul Bigelow Sears book, uh, Where There Is Life. Uh, it's an introductory sort of primer to ecology. And he has another particular book that's called um, Deserts on the Move. And the, re the reference that Frank uses, I'm not sure which of these two books, and I'm, I'm not going to run through it here, but it's um, simply put, I seem to remember encountering that whenever we get that definition of ecology in Sears' book, Sears is talking about Samuel Butler's Erewhon in that book at the same time. And I um, and, and so I, I, I'm not sure if this is... I had a wee bit about this, and whenever we get to it, we can have a wee look. And I will try and actually maybe re go back and jump ahead into the PhD and see if I could dig this up myself. But I'm pretty certain that I found that, that Sears was well aware of um, Samuel Butler's Erewhon. And, um, the, it was and, and, and I think um, <clears throat> we kind of, I think we caught Frank Herbert in a kind of double, 
oh, I don't know where that came from. And then very quickly, we have him referencing exactly where it came from. So I just wanted to say that I think um, I'm pretty certain that probably Herbert didn't read Erewhon in his youth and um, that I think he must have read it as part of his research on Dune and into deserts um, beginning in the 50s. So there we go. I, I just thought that was interesting. And, and as I said, um, a lot of this stuff I did years ago and as, as we come to it, we can look at it with fresh eyes and we can check, check those references. Sorry about that, folks. That's my dog, Evil Noodles, barking in the background. Um, if part of evolution, Bab says, is adaptation uh, to or as a result of environment, then it's subject only to what mankind exposes the machine. Um, John, I forget, how does Alia connect with the Baron? A man when the sisterhood normally has affinity with women. Hopefully it wasn't because the Baron's sexuality more of a dysfunction um, uh, as a kind of forced or guided evolution. Um, we'll go to you, Babs, there first. As part of evolution is adaptation to or as a result of the environment, then it is subject only to that which mankind exposes the machine. Um, as a kind of forced or guided evolution. Up until a point, I suppose, maybe... Um, I don't think mankind's in control of the environment, Babs. Um, so what I suppose that the whole thing is uh, what, what we think we, we can do and what, how we go about using machines um, can change. Um, and machines can be built and end up being used for something else altogether. Um, evol evolution and ad adaptation for it. Yeah, I mean, man is the idea is that man is a machine animal. That as, as we create these things, they're an extension, an extension of us, and I mean it's a it's a common enough theory. I think that, that you know we are a bit like that. That um, I suppose only that which mankind exposes the machine. How, yes, how I suppose how we use technology is thoroughly important. Um, you know, and you know, at, for example, a knife can be a tool or it can be a weapon. Um, it's, a, it's as simple as that, I suppose, and how things do evolve is, is particularly interesting. Um, one of the things about the technology that's, that's described, I think you just saw it in the video, is that the, 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 the wonder about how the, the Exchange could create such a thing with, with simple mechanical technology. And uh, we were talking a wee bit about the anti kithra mechanism, which is um, an analog computer built around 200 BC, and it's a it's incredible, but it's also very simple and mechanical. Pardon me. John, to your thing, Alia's, Alia's connection with the Baron, I mean, the, the, obviously the familial connection, it's her grandfather and she murders him. Um, but I, I, as much as we can, um, Babs is quite into Alia, and I think Alia is one of my favourite characters as well. Um, I, I genuinely think that there's been a few ideas put forward about why does Alia have the Baron in her other memory? And um, I, I think they kind of go down sometimes. Uh, what was it? Hermaph the, the, the barn could be a hermaphrodite, or the alley could be a hermaphrodite, or, or just different plays within the, the, the idea of gender and, and genetic memory. Um, but ultimately, I, and I think it's because she is a very tragic character, I do think it's madness. And, and he's simply not, he's not really there. He's just only there in her mind. Um, John, ah, here we go, Babs. Here's Babs. Uh, idea. John, my favourite hypothesis as to why Alia can access the barn is that he was a true uh, hermaphrodite who presented meal. There you go. Uh, uh, John, he was a female. <laughs> um, hermaphrodites obviously have... Um, from her, her, the, the child of Hermes and Aphrodite um, have both um, uh, genders genitalia. Um, so yeah, it's it's a good it's a good one. It's it's a aha. It's it's a logical thing, Stepan, isn't it? That we could um, present that. Uh, also, the Baron wasn't the Baron, but a strong female playing. <laughs> Uh, fascinating. It is uh, Ali's question is really interesting. I I do tend to go with the madness side of it because. I think there's there's analogs to her character and, and characters like Ophelia and so on. And her end is, um, um, forgive me if I'm wrong. Um, I'm not can't remember how she dies, but I think she dies by uh, defenestration, which is throwing yourself out of a window. I, if I'm 
I might be wrong about that. Maybe you can remind me. Um, but yeah, I, I see her as quite a tragic character. And I think we were talking about, um, I suppose the thing about, is it Cassandra who has that prescience uh, in Greek mythology? And it's kind of the madness that not, not knowing that nobody will ever know what you're like and understand you, you know? Uh, yes, she, Bab says, yep, she jumped. <laughs> I think the word defenestrate is a great word. Um, <laughs> there you go. Um, so, yeah, she's quite tragic. I, I do do prefer my own personal pre preferences. I do think that she is madness and how that madness manifests itself in such, in such a powerful human as well. Um, because Ali is very powerful, um, very deadly. Um, right from the get-go, as we as we know in June, you know, as I said, it is, it is her as a child, and a very small child that kills the Baron. Um, so you know, there's a, you know, there, there's there's a total loss of innocence for Ali, and it's probably I think something that Ali's character yearns for. Um, so that's my bit. There is a we we're talking about. There's a, if you haven't seen it, by the way, it's it's quite. A, if you, depends on if what sort of anime you like, but it's a kind. Of, it's called Helsing. And um, it's got really good theme music. It's very cool. Um, the the TV show is not probably for everybody. It's an eighteen, and I think it's a it's a Dracula working for a sort of secret organisation within the British government, and uh, it's quite interesting on some of its ideas on on British society from Japan. But it, it's um, uh, the main the main female character at the end of every episode has a has the the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen in her her mind and has we arguments with him and like what the heck are you doing here and stuff, and um, it's 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 a uh, it's a very interesting thing to look at just the week the, these you know the, a lot of these Japanese cartoons will put a little small cartoon at the end and it's those things and um, there he is and he's drawn the same way as uh, <coughs> excuse me as he's portrayed in the in the David Lynch. Um, film you know as if you were shared in her madness you know so yeah it's it, and it is it's it is one of those things that i think occasionally frank loses control of a couple of ideas or and, he, and he, he's on record as saying this that he doesn't want to explain everything to you and it, 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 again i think that's part of um why we're all sitting here having a chat about June, June tonight is that regardless of what we all think, it's full of mysteries and lessons and things that aren't quite answered for us. Um, you know, it alludes to a lot of things and it has allegories and it has direct references to the real world. Um, you know, so sometimes, you know, as I said, I think, I think Babs's idea, I, I think I've, I've heard Babs's idea recently and I'd never heard it before. I actually thought it was pretty good. Um, you know, uh, and especially with the, 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 the really is, I suppose that, uh, Paul and Alia are a pairing, um, very much so part of that. They're a male, female syzygy and they're a male, female Janus pairing, you know, and, um, uh, yeah, Alia is a great character. Um, and it, it's a real pity i suppose but but the tragedy of ali is i think what makes her um an attractive you know um as much as we read a book like june for for all sorts of reasons it's um, um as much as it's the, the high highfalutin people and so on it is meant to be a kind of about humanity and and we invest in the characters because we you know we, we want there's emotions involved and so on so i generally think we find her quite tragic um and uh, you know, but quite imp a really impressive character up until up until that point. Not nothing. Not meant not to mention having to keep, uh, these are discussions on answerable questions is entertainment fun as heck. Thank you very much. But uh, sometimes I think the answers are not realised yet in the later book. Frank played the long game. Yes, it's John. We've been talking a wee bit about that lately. Um, but particularly things that are set up in in the very first June book that have no payoff. And uh, in, in particular, we're looking at the line that uh, that talks about the, the disastrous, it's in one of the appendices, it talks about the disastrous handling of the Arrakis affair by the Bene Gesserit. And it, it, it's entirely suggestive that the breeding program isn't theirs and that they're being manipulated by an outside agency. And it's, it's right there. <laughs> and it's probably suggestive, we were saying, of the, of the enemy that returns. And, and uh, we looked a bit about 
the possibilities of of that enemy tonight because the i suppose because of the Aronian attachment and um the ideas about where they're set up there is i know a lot of people think it's the, there's the face dancers or the enemy or, or advanced face dancers or it's the artificial intelligence some kind of machine intelligence um and again i suppose as modern readers we have different uh, attitudes to things like ai and stuff um but there's three there's and, and, you know there's three or four possibilities and, and because we don't have those answers um we've heard we've heard a lot of people sort of make a good good argument for each one of them and i can't i personally can't shoot any of the arguments down and i don't think they can either and that's what's fun about it that, that each one is valid and there's enough evidence in the books to suggest you know for, for it could be any of them um Babs is saying, you're, John, you're likely right there. Herbert's love for subordinating uh, expectations is part of his charm. Absolutely. And he's, I, I, I keep saying this and hope I'm not offending people who love Frank Herbert, because I love Frank Herbert myself. But he's a deceptive writer. Um, and deception is um, a fundamental in, in the Dune series. The whole first Dune book is set up to trick the author. And uh, it's it's wonderful for us because we've all read it, or most of us have read it. And we have hindsight. We, if we've got past June, we know the trick, and we know the deceit, and we get it uh, because it is a it is a big you know Paul Atreides is he? And I actually said this yesterday, and I must apologise because someone said Paul's not a hero, and I went, no, he's not. Yes, he is. Um, he is, and I, 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 I regretted saying that. It's just sort of because we use the word hero in normal conversation. And it's what we want out of a protagonist and a story. I want a good guy. I want a, you know that kind of heroic action. Um, and he's Paul's as much modelled on the classical hero, the, the, which is uh, the epic hero, which is also a tragic hero. All the heroes are tragic. Um, you know, so yeah, so, so subordinating expectations. He's and. The other thing is he works on the other side of that. I think, you know, Frank really does put an awful lot of thought into his writing. As much as he's keeping stuff hidden from you, at the exact same time he's giving you foresight into events in the book that you're that you're actually getting foreknowledge of that the characters don't have. And uh, whenever you're reading, you're, you're always a step ahead of the action, kind of. It's like you're you're getting reports, but you're you're almost in the far future learning history about the events in June and you're looking at your historical documents and then you get a little snapshot of action that kind of fits in with that and we move forward um you know and uh yeah so so the, the he's a, yeah it tricks you and again you know what do you want from a book do you want do you, uh, and think about it in, in terms of what frank's talking about if you pick up a book and have presence then you know everything that's going to happen in that book and you're not going to read it because why bother <laughs> if you see what i mean it's it's um it, it's a very good hook in terms of how he grabs you and uh pulls you into this world um and it is it's it's almost as if you're being fed reports on the Ar arrakis affair as you're reading you know oh wait oh um you know but you you have foreknowledge you, you immediately know yui's gonna but you know yui's betrayal happens long 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 after you're told about it <laughs> And you're well aware of it and you go in you you keep reading with that knowledge and it gives you a, an extra layer of uh, insight into the characters actually because we can see how their deception works and we also see how that deception works against things like uh jessica's bene Gesserit training it's the thing that's the, the one the one surety that they have in june the one thing that they think is infallible is the fallible thing the the stamp of approval of the suit doctor Paul has depth, good and bad, John says. And right, there is a foreknowledge. Sometimes I wonder if a thing is just read as foreshadowing uh, when it would be realized. Uh, Paul's depth, good and bad. Um, yeah, so the, the foreknowledge, well, um, super real is just given as we come. I'll get to that in a wee second. Super, super surreal, sorry. Um, one of the things just read is fore foreshadowing is, is is kind of it's not foreshadowing at all it, it is prescience it's, it's absolute knowledge we're, we're it is being presented often from a historian's point of view 
So most of June's really from Ireland's biographies or children's books on Paul Atreides, etc. But that indicates a point in the future where she's in place of, uh, you know, acting as a historian to the court of Moadib. And it's interesting, actually, that the Atreides put all of the Carino, whenever they do engage with the Carino children, that they tend to put them work as, as tend to put them to work as historians. Both Irulan acts as a historian. Sorry, making the TV wall or the screen wobble there. Acts as a historian for the Atreides family, but also it's the same role that um, Leto has in mind for Faran. Um, he's going to write his history for him. And there's a real we have if whenever we get to the Leto the second episode in terms of evolution. Um, there's a really, really insightful conversation about that, and it is to do with making Faradin his historian. Um, Super Surreal says, can we, can we say Paul is a hero because he's willing to face his terrible future? Yeah, and, and again, it's um, what do we mean by a hero? Uh, because he is a hero. Um, and Paul... Paul uh, Paul very much like the tragic hero. There, there's a lot of Oedipus in, in, in Paul Atreides, especially his end. Um, yes, but it's I think the thing with Paul Atreides is he's different types of hero. And um, one of the things I think we were talking about, let me see, sorry, I put these books away. We were talking about um, Lord Raglan's The Hero, uh, oh, here they are. Sorry, um, Lord Raglan's the hero, and I, I think a much, much better book, by the way, um, is Hero Worship, Heroes, Hero Worship, and the Heroic in History, by given it its full title, uh, by Thomas Carlyle, which is an exceptional book. How, how these books treat the study of history, for particularly Carlyle's, um, super surreal. Is I mean, these are from a series of lectures, for example, um, they're from. Uh, Goodness gracious, New York. I love these old books, by the way. They're a wee bit delicate sometimes. These are from uh, 1840. But his his treatment of the hero, um, I think, is really good. Um, what he, he looks at, basically, we, and takes heroes as individuals. So his study approach is the hero is divinity. The hero is prophet. The hero is poet. Hero is priest. Hero is a man of letters uh, and a hero as king and, and gives us, I mean, he uses Odin, Muhammad, Dante, Luther, uh, you know, uh, Russell, Cromwell, Napoleon, etc. Are, are his examples in the study on the hero. It's very good. So I, th I think Paul is a different, at different points in June, a different type of hero. And the, it's the failure of the hero. Is when he turns away from the path but the, the the point at this point the thing at that point is that everything he's done up until that point was therefore for nothing so if he's subjugated and killed 60 billion people and crushed all these religions the point where he turns away from that path can be seen as um selfish and um all of those people then everything kind of would have happened for uh, in vain and the idea is then that mankind will get wiped out but at least he doesn't have to slaughter all these people i'd say when he comes to that um you know uh, that point it's um the, 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 it's it's the tragedy of politics that makes him yes there, there's a nobility in what he does because who could who could take that but it's it, the thing is that we we actually do keep coming back to Paul. We we do, no matter what he's done, we can justify it as he justifies it with with the golden path. And um, no problems, Bob. If you've got to do stuff and keep listening, keep listening. <laughs> Bob is saying he didn't face it at all. His terrible purpose. Um, Paul Ram from the golden path didn't realize the vision of Saul. So it's we we talked about what is the golden path and is it real. And um, because you, you, could, you could, I think we were saying, for example, whenever Paul's idea of the golden path, whenever he stops, that vision of the golden path ends and Leto's vision begins. And it's a new golden path, though it's pretty much the same one. And um, I, I, sometimes, I, think, I think the golden path is a part of the warning about heroes. Um, because the, the whole the whole hero thing, super surreal, works in so many different levels, and we 
we have all that whole bunch of videos and that coming up um because he's a response to different types of heroes um he's a re he's a response to the political leaders in society at the time he's a response to the, the heroes in science fiction and he has the trappings of many 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 types of heroes um and and the, they are different types of heroes that you know um they're, they're, paul paul has the mantle of political leader religious leader um you know and, and, and a, it's uh, he's also very aware of of how the future changes based on how people act around him and how they'll use his his own his own self in the same way that he's aware of how he could use his own father you know for example in shrining his body and stuff and the the things that he sees happening but he turns away from it and i think we're sort of saying to, to not engage with the golden path would be possibly more moral which means you can just mankind gets wiped out at the end but mankind will die one day anyway and it just means that we all don't have to slaughter each other to create a crucible of of uh, natural selection um so can we say he's a hero yes I, th I think it's so hard to shake paul as a hero but it's it's a warning june's a warning about heroes and paul is your warning i mean that's the thing it's it's all good intentions and i think ultimately paul is appalled by himself and recoils from it and th there is something tragic in that and ultimately, I think that we do admire Paul because the lessons are, that he's trying to present are, are lessons also in the end to himself, I think. And um, Leto II is the ultimate critic of Paul. I think we're, we're, Paul exists inside Leto II's memories. And much of, much of what's great about God Emperor of June is we actually get um, a critique of tyranny but, uh, by Leto II, who's the ultimate tyrant. But he's also critiquing his own father within that. Um, but yeah, Paul is is and is, uh, that's the thing. It, he is a hero, and, and the question is, does he? It's not about whether he is a hero or not. Absolutely, I mean, he's constructed to be the best possible hero, and that that's why Paul Atreides stands out. I think um, amongst all other science fiction heroes, he's the hero of heroes. Uh, he has a comment on the hero, but it's a question of, I suppose, in the end, what we think of him, super surreal. Um, I don't know what you think, but it's a question of, can we look at him from a moral, whatever your own ethical point of view is, and go, I admire that man. And in that case, he's heroic. Um, but the term hero also applies to a lot of very, very bad men and women. Um, so, but yes, it, it depends on how you look, how you personally look at Paul Atreides at the end of, uh, at the end of Children of Dune, and, and what do you think he's his choices were and the sacrifices he he's made, uh, not just for himself but the sacrifices of other living beings. Um, life is cheap to politicians, I'll say that much. Um, life is cheap to governments. Um, so there we go. I hope that answered your question. But I, 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 there is something I, I still, I do admire Paul Atreides as a character, but he, I, I do look at him as a monster. Um, but I, I, I see that there's a, 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 there's a redemptive aspect to him. I think. But um, we have that kind of thing. I don't, I don't think if you've killed six million people, and then you go, oh no, I've done a terrible thing. I'm really sorry. I repent. I don't, I don't think it's enough. I think you have to own what you do. Um, John says, listening to this, I suddenly realized Paul was obeying the Asimov zeroth rule when following the golden path. Um, oh, I, I, what is that? Can you refresh my memory, John, on Asimov zero rule? Whatever that one is, I can't remember. Is that a zero law? Of, I know there's four laws. I remember there being four laws of robotics. Most people think there's three. And he, he added an extra one in um, the bicentennial man. But my old memory is fuzzy, fuzzy, John. Can you remind me, please, of uh, what Asimov Zeroth rule is? Super Surreal says, I think he's a hero in respect of what he faces. He's very proactive. Um, yes, I suppose. Uh, part part of the, the I suppose, that uh, the monomyth thing is also that the call to adventure, I suppose, and the rejecting of the initial call. Um, yes, I will. Thank you very much, John. I think you're going to look. Um, but uh, yes, I, I, you see, the thing is, as much as once we've got the warning about Paul, 
Paul Atreides and June Messiah, and we follow that through. Um, and you know, it is a you know, it's a hard thing to say. It's a terrible burden. Um, it'd be hard to put yourself in the place of that character. And um, Zero Law is a robot may not harm humanity or by inaction allow humanity to come to harm. Ah, I see. Yes. Thank you very much, John. Um, I think the fourth law of robotics from the bicentennial man is to do with robot being able to protect the robot, I suppose. Um, if I remember correctly, it's been a long time since I read that. I can actually tell you when I did read it. I read, uh, just out of my memory, I read the bicentennial man in 1997. Uh, for, yeah. So Paul is forced to not allow humanity to come to harm because he's precious. I see. It's a bit like um, by action or inaction, I suppose, sometimes. You can look at the golden path a bit, a bit the way, hello, girls. Sorry, my doggies have just come in. Hello, no. Hello, Holly. Um, you could look sometimes at maybe even the golden path, even Melange to a degree is a bit similar to the ring, um, the ring of Sauron from... Uh, the Lord of the Rings, and um, that ring itself is based on the Ring of Gyges. Um, I don't know if any of you know this, uh, the, of the Ring of Gyges, but it's a story from um, Plato's Republic. And I suppose that the, the whole point of the ring, you know, it's, it's a quite question of philosophically, morally, ethically, what would you do with such a thing? Um, you know, and obviously because to be invisible is uh, to, to be able to move on the scene, etc., is a level of deception immediately. There's nothing good can come from such a thing. But, so the, the ultimate point of the Ring of the Gages is no matter what, and it's the same with the Ring and the Lord of the Rings, no matter what excuse that you can come up with for using it, it's wrong um, because it's 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 um, it's a use of power and um, it's a use of individual power. And... Uh, Simply put, the moral ethical choice, once you understand the nature of these things, the, the only conclusion really is to never, ever use it. Probably the best thing is to bury the damn thing and make sure no one ever uses it. Um, so every, everybody who puts the ring on in the Lord of the Rings makes the wrong choice. Um, you know, it's just simply the, the, the aspect of its power is all you need. And, and, and it's a promise of power. It's an enticement. But to take the promises to put the thing on, and then you're you're beholden to it, so that the trick is never to ever use such a thing. The golden path. I I personally believe. I think um, uh, John Super Surreal that uh, the golden path is is any any person any leader's vision. It's their go golden path. It's their ah the the way to this. That you know the we, we, you get a lot of this in politics. A third way, a new way. That you know. Um, and, it, and I think it's meant to, because the golden path changes, the minute it ceases from Paul, Paul's attempt to carry on with it, it ceases, and it becomes Leto the second's golden path that changes. We have no third golden path, as much as the Bene Gesserit are trying to figure out what was going on. And, and simply, that it's quite possible that this whole thing, that these ideas die with these men, and that it's potentially just part of their own vision. Uh, and you could argue that because they're not human, it could be even a, a part of their own madness to a degree. So the, the the thing is a point, I suppose, if you want to talk about what is a what is a golden path, well, it's Augustus Caesar's idea for the Roman Empire. That's that's a golden path. It's Hitler's idea for a thousand year Reich. That's his golden path. Unfortunately, when each of these, well, the Roman Empire continues well. Augustus is the first emperor, but. Um, you know that that idea of a thousand year right dies with Hitler, and his golden. You know this this and again Hitler is one of these um, people that Paul Atreides is modelled on. Um, he's he's modelled on a wonderfully strange group of people if you think about it. Paul Paul is a a, a real melange. <laughs> Sorry, folks, for the June reference. He is a real melange of. Um, both real and mythological beings, um, you know, and, and even you know, um, I suppose icons and, and uh, main religious individuals of, of several major religions in them. You've got people like um, you've got the you know the Greek myths and the Agamemnon, the Atreides, and that Orestes to do a degree as well, and um, 
you know, we, we have the, the, the modern kind of a adventure. The, the person that you'll hear bandied about is the white savior trope thing is, is you know, Lawrence of Arabia, T. E. Lawrence. Um, I was looking for this today, by the way, folks. Um, uh, uh, as much as it, we talk, I talk a lot about the classics and classicists because I'm, I'm a very, very fond of it. And um, T. E. Lawrence was one as well. But you, uh, if you know him, as a, so a lot of people know of him as one thing, I suppose, Lawrence of Arabia. But um, if you're into getting copies of the Iliad and the Odyssey, I, I have several different translations of both. But um, he's very well known as a translator of the Odyssey. Um, I um, there's, there's, I have different copies, but my, my copy of the Odyssey, I've got E.V. Ruse and T.E. Shaw's, and I have a uh, Pope's copy, you know, um, which is quite poetic. But I, I, I actually think T.E. Lawrence, T.E. Shaw's translation of the, the Odyssey is one of the best, one of the most readable. Uh, and certainly one that if you if you wanted to hand it over to somebody as a hey read this and I'm not I don't want the two it's it's a good it's an accessible translation. Um, how do you feel? Okay. So Paul is forced to not allow humanity to come to harm because he has prescience. See the thing is, well, maybe it won't ever happen. You know, John, and I, I think I also like playing around. Uh, we talked the other day about why, why doesn't humanity ever lose one of these battles at the end of the universe? That would be oh, it's just a. And I think we were we were joking with Babs that you know we could we could all go to the restaurant at the end of the universe and watch mankind lose one of these Titanic typhoon struggles at the end of the universe. Um, I suppose it, it is a, is an aspect that's common to a lot of religions and myths is this battle at the end of the world type thing. So you know we have this things like Armageddon and uh, Ragnarok and, and so on and so forth. Um, so there, there's quite a you know. Quite a common kind of trope all around the world, I think. Common because people always look to their end, I think. Um, how do you feel about the new movie being seminal version of the books? Uh, and what might be good or bad about that, says Super Surreal. The seminal version of the book, but in terms of that, that's the one that we would all sit around and talk about. Um, I think that's fine. Uh, no bother at all. I, I haven't seen it, and I, I, I don't want to prejudge it. I suppose, uh, that's what we're doing. Super Surreals, we're counting down, aren't we, to... It won't be here till the 21st of October. So um, I have, you know, if, if something is the, you know, gives that, that definitive look or aspect to the book, that's fine. Um, and it can, it, it can be good or bad. I suppose I've grown up knowing the David Lynch version and visualizing that a bit in my head. But then also, you know, I've, I've got a lot of the original Dune illustrations and how we look at characters and things like that. How I look at Yui, for example, was very, very much informed by the, the black and white illustrators. Um, so I, I don't think it's good, good to be similar word it means to get the people talking about it, and I think that's fine. Um, I, the, only, the only thing sometimes is I think that th things detract from books is sometimes we get, excuse me, combinations of characters or shoe-ins. And it can often be confusing if you if you haven't read the books, I suppose. But then then your ignorance really is of the books is a thing that kind of doesn't affect those things. If you ever remember the Ralph Bashi cartoon of the Lord of the Rings, um, the elf that, that meets the hobbits. It's, it's um, in the books. It's Glorfindel, isn't it? Um, but in the, in the in the Ralph Bashi cartoon, they make that elf Legolas. And I think in the in the Lord of the Rings film they make it Arwen, um, which is a real sad thing because Glorfindel is one of them. The, uh, looking at if you know him in Lord of the Rings, he's a real kick-ass guy, and it's a, it's a real pity they didn't send him um, because they should have sent him. He's he he would have been a very good uh, ad, uh, addition to the the company of nine if you see what I mean. But it, well, the the point I'm trying to make, super surreal, is sometimes you know different versions of things that impact upon how you view that world. Um, and for example, a long time I, I actually was really influenced on on the look of the Lord of the Rings by the drawings of I think Angus McBride, who who you know very elegant pencil drawings and really just gave a, a different look and feel to it. So. I, I I I think that they're, they're they're doing their best. It's a rich world, and they're going to do their best to present it to us. And um, I I I think the 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 detail, if the, if the devil's in the detail, I think it would be great. And 
the more detail that you see, the more things that you notice from the books, then I think that's going to get the fans talking, you know, guys like yourself. And, uh, yeah, I really want to see what the wee lights look like, you know, the the, the wee globes on the, or the suspenser lights, uh, the Holtzman lights, because uh, I really thought they were brilliant in, in the David Lynch film, to the point where I've always wanted a set. I'd love a set in my house, I agree. John says, yes, prescience is a nuke, and towards the end, everyone is able to achieve prescience. Um, what uh, the other thing, John? I think is what's the point in having? I, I don't know what, what any of you guys. Um, Super surreal said yes. I can't wait. No, like neither can I. Um, what's the point of prescience at the end of the universe, John? Uh, have you thought about that? <laughs> uh, uh, just, um, that's a, that. That's really the one point where you want to be able to look backward because there's nothing to go forward to. I suppose prescience is absolutely. Um, is a is a is a, a thing that's desired by people. It's a fantasy, and um, you you can predict things if you have enough data. But to be pre prescient, to have pre knowledge of a thing, is would be madness. I think. And um, part of me thinks about if you think about the construction of the deities of the Abrahamic religions, how people construct deities over time. That ultimately you end up with a no offense to anybody, but with um with it, the main definition of a deity really is i think we talked about this something that's omniscient omnipresent uh omnipotent and i don't know why but uh, you occasionally hear omnibenevolent but that one doesn't add up with the evidence um that's presented by our depictions of such such gods but for, personally i think oh, the conception of such a such a divine being can only be created by a man because it's the ultimate um it's the ultimate curse and i think uh maybe you'll all agree with me but maybe you're not at all but god emperor gives you a, an attempt because i don't think anyone could possibly do this but an attempt to give you some insight into what it must be like um so to, to be god in the in the descriptions of um the abrahamic or sorry, the abrahamic faiths to me is a description of hell um and a, a permanent existential eternal hell um so I, I would not like to be that deity and even even um there's there's joy in leader of the seconds gaps in his presence he can't see everything he's not an absolute deity uh mutually assured destruction used in nuke topics presence is a nuke but yes oh sorry uh, presence is a nuke towards the end everyone is able to achieve presence um, mutually assured destruction using nuke topic presence is a nuke, but yes, at the end, all have nukes. Yeah, mutually assured destruction, madness. Um, yes, indeed. Well, I don't know about you guys. I'm I'm a Generation X child of the '70s, and I've grown up with the, you know, I suppose we've all grown up with the threat of nuclear war, and um, you know, it, it's it's a change thing. I think uh, currently a lot of generation generations between have thought, forgot about it. But it's certainly in the early 80s, we had all those you know, films like this at the day after tomorrow. We were all on the edge of our seats. Um, I, I think the possession of nuclear weapons by any state to the point where there, the existence of that state at any given point in history, that, that it's essentially what they're saying is that whenever we collapse, because all empires and civilizations do go the way of the dodo, that we're going to take everyone else with us. And they're, 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 I think I live in a well, the UK, there's no nuclear weapons in Ireland, but Northern Ireland's part of the United, well, it's not actually part of the United Kingdom at all, but it's the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. But, um, you know, I mean, within the, within the political demographic grouping of these islands, whatever you want to call it, we have nuclear weapons. And it's amazing when you think about the people that you put in charge, because we have a complete idiot in charge of the UK government. And he's a classically educated idiot, by the way, um, and he, who pretends to be a buffoon, uh, Boris Johnson. And um, some of his speeches that, you know, recently is more, more noticeable for what he says than what he doesn't. I'm sorry, for what he does not say, uh, particularly with the, the recent things. With the, Yeah, we're, we're a bit under siege here in uh, Northern Ireland at the moment. Um, we have about eight, where I live, I have about eight police patrols a day. So it feels very much like we're under siege. Um, where my dad lives down the road, you wouldn't the police wouldn't dare do that. Um, it's quite interesting. Uh, <clears throat> mutually assured destruction is gross stupidity. Um, 
Yeah, prescience is a new game. Understand what you mean, John. It's uh, it, and if everybody's got it at the end of the day, then it just becomes a banal evolution. It becomes pointless as an evolutionary advancement, doesn't it? it just becomes the norm. Um, you can, yeah. You, you, I mean, we, we talked about consciousness and the idea of the try hard uh, and has a mega point and so on, and you can take it really quite quite far places. But um, it, a, a great thing that we do in, in kind of theory and argument is that the old reductio ad absurdum. If if you can pick something apart to make it sound absurd, then you, it probably is. Um, but yes, it's it's also the same with all the all the dead characters. Or I, I I think in the um, Super Surreal says, I've got to go, Doc, but uh, I'll be chiming in the next time you're on. You're on. Thank you very much, Super Surreal. All the best and have a good night. Uh, a good evening, wherever you are, or possibly even good morning. Take care. Anyway, thank you for joining us. Um, so there you go. Um you your destruction using new talk business? New, 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 got to go, Doc. Oh, sorry. Interesting, says John. Um, so any, anyway, guys, any questions for me? Um, while we're sitting here chattering, we haven't got too much into the June tech as well. But funny what we said about something being notable by its absence is exactly kind of how the, the God Ember, um, uh, you know, knows that the no globes are there. And uh, but yes, I don't, I don't know about yourself there, John. What 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 do you think of that kind of thing? Um, but I, I'm not a fan of nuclear weapons. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I've I've several books on the conferences and stuff from, you know, these things from from the time, you know, like uh, papers by Carl Sagan and stuff. All the scientists coming out to explain what an, uh, the nuclear winter was, basically. Um, but I, I have uh, I have my own theories about nuclear weapons, <laughs> and um, and yeah, you can make much bigger bombs than nukes. <laughs> I've got to the point where I think nukes are being are quite small. Um, mm. but uh, yeah, uh, the, 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 I'll tell you something. The worst thing about the whole nuclear arsenal thing is, is it's a lesson that June teaches you: is all machines fail. And uh, ah, the stone burners, yes, that's right. Um, and uh, all machines eventually fail and degrade. And considering the lethality of of nuclear weapons, I think. Uh, you know, but we've launched enough of them on the planet. They've done enough, uh, done enough damage. I, I, I theorize that there can be plenty of good uses for them, limited uses of nuclear weapons. And uh, I, I think if we ever go into the, if planet Earth ever sorts itself out, that I think mankind is at the point now where uh, we all need to stop thinking about money and, and become, um, go into wifery and husbandry and, and uh, sort the planet out um, if you want to keep living on it. The planet's fine, by the way. Uh, it says it's, it sends its regards and tells you all that it'll be here long after you go. So it's not about the planet, and uh, it really isn't. It's about your ability to survive on it. And um, on, at this point, you've got two options really, and uh, one of them is terraforming, and the other one is um, pantropy. So human beings are either going to have to sort the planet out, or they're going to have to alter themselves physiologically to live in it or, or you know, go underground. But um, I feel a lot of June is about proliferation of weapons and escalations. You're quite correct, John. And, and part of um, part of what we're looking at here with this episode is, is on the evolution of uh, the whole thing that we're looking at at the minute is the evolution of machinery in June. And then we'll go on to the how that affects people. But uh, so we've, we've split it up really. We started off with X tonight and the machines there so yeah each each machine and the, and the prescriptions of the of the butlerian jihad as well create you know there's a there's a cause and effect um for example the use of personal shields is why you you carry a knife um you know i'm, I'm not too sure why they don't use swords really or, or spears or longer slow you know <laughs> certain types of weapons um but uh the, so that, you know, the, if you, if you think about that, John, um, as technology progresses, particularly within the military, the main development that the military always wants is to be able to kill its opponents from further and further away, to the point you know, push a button, and around the world it goes. Um, and that 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 is the main development in technology in terms of weaponry is about killing your opponent from further and further away. Um, so that it, it, it's interesting that, the, the, that there are standoffs and that, for example, the, if you fire a laser at a, 
Holtzman-shaped nuclear explosion. And you, you kind of think, well, the Harkonnens are using all these suicide trips. Why don't they just use one guy to commit suicide and boom, nuclear explosion? Um, and he was going to commit suicide anyway because he's a suicide trip. So the, the counter to that is that the, the, the this type of, uh, I suppose, it's equivalent of a nuclear explosion, is undetectable within the Dune universe from a normal nuclear explosion. And that's why that tactic is not used. But you're you're absolutely right. Each each technology escalates, and we get we get this evolution, and that affects people, that affects the technology, that affects it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know, and um, there are a number of technologies that do affect you know human evolution. I'm I'm very curious about the phone, you know, at the minute. Um, in, in terms of not that this is my phone, but you see so many young people walking around like this. As in the street, and it's the curvature to the neck in particular, and I see it all the time. I see it not just young people, all sorts of people, but it's 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 um it's one of those things that uh, you know enough of us do it'll sort of start embedding into the genes and stuff like that. I think um, all sorts of evolution is funny, you know, and a lot, particularly machines evolve, and um, I, I I think something that's interesting, guys. I don't know if you know this, but. Uh, Northern Ireland does not really produce science fiction writers. And um, it, it's to do with something that I think is Northrop Price is that, that there, there's such a um, common association between science fiction and myth. But uh, there, was, there was also a point that somebody else made, and I'm trying to remember who it was, that it might have been Brian Stableford, but that um, evolution is fundamentally tied to science fiction as a, as a form of uh, literature. And um, that a type literatures literature like science fiction cannot appear in a society where there is no ongoing discussion about evolution. Uh, and interestingly enough, I live in such a society, and we Northern Ireland is one of the few. You know, we do not produce science fiction writers. Uh, we do have a couple from before the we the whole civil rights thing collapsed here. And I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing a bit, but as a society, this my society produces crime writers, horror writers, uh, fantasy writers. We had a, a couple of Northern Irish people contributing to 2008, I suppose, but um, we, we don't produce science fiction as a society because we're not a forward-looking society in any way whatsoever. We're, we're completely, um, as I said, the term is retarded atavism. Uh, to, 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 to slow your development in order to be like your grandfather's. Is what that means, and it's it's what happens to the Fremen, the the museum Fremen, or that in June. So there we go, John. Yes, indeed, proliferation, weapons, and escalation. That evolution society thing is fascinating. Yeah, well, it's it's it's. You'll find these quotes. Um, they're 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 up ahead there, I think. Um, but but you know, there's a lot of people that just say, I don't. You know, in this country, particularly, evolution is um. Uh, all of all of this country's problems where I'm at are caused by Christianity. Uh, to the, the, you understand Northern Ireland's a sectarian society and the two sects that we're talking about are, are Catholicism and pretty much Protestant, any kind of Protestant church. Um, <clears throat> you know, but um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a strange thing that uh, evolution is as part of the religious war, I suppose. And the argument against evolution is, is very poor and spurious. Um, the, the people that deny it can't even look at the, you as a from the point of when you're born to becoming an adult, you continue to evolve yourself. And if you want to call that growing up or growth, it's still the same thing. We, we evolve as human beings to deny evolution in terms of species is, is quite bizarre, I think. Anyway, it requires very little thought. And um, the main arguments here are science versus um, that the religious faith versus science, and that those are the only two camps of of intellectual debate. You can either have faith or you can have science, and um, unfortunately, I'm someone who's well aware that there are many other options there as well, and so both camps tend to ignore historia. So um, you can believe something, you can know something. That's the difference between faith and not and science. But if you do, you can also inquire into it. And if only people did that, then I think we might have a bit of a more forward-thinking society. Um, but we have a wee bit of hope in our new generation of people, I'm, I'm hoping.
but um, the whole the whole religious thing here is also. I mean, you'll get a lot of that from June. The whole the whole religious control thing here is generational, and it's fully embedded into the education system. And uh, and they even acknowledge that it's generational. I think. So evolution in society thing is is fascinating. And uh, John, uh, you know, we, a lot of people talk about um, the whole Darwin thing in, in Victorian society. And you, you often hear these wonderfully misinformed arguments about what, what the, the natural selection um, is, you know, and the uh, theory of evolution by means of natural selection. And uh, often based on misconceptions of, of Darwin and his works, and by, by not actually reading it, you'll get this whole, I'm, I'm not descended from monkeys, kind of, you know, I'm, I'm not, he's never said that. And, uh, um, if you want to know the answer, by the way, uh, to what is the origin of species, so because Darwin's book is on the origin of species, um, you know, looks like by means of natural selection. So he never answered it. And he's 18 uh, editions, I think, of iterations, at least the last time I looked, I think, something like that, different, different, you know, rewrites of the book. So Darwin never answers the question, what is the origin of species? I think I, point, I, I might have put this into the videos, but he, he basically thought at the, in the end that uh, life formed spontaneously, new species formed spontaneously. Um, so that was it. But but uh, a lot of the other thing that, that mankind is descended from apes is, is a misnomer, and it's to, it's to do with the descent of man, uh, which is a book that came along later um, and doesn't say that either. So it's. Um, so evolution, yes, is it's one of those hot topics in, in science fiction and in the world, um, mainly because I mean I, I just don't think it would evolution would ever be a problem if it simply didn't line up with certain narratives, you know, from religion. Um, but yes, it, it's fascinating. You do you can see it all right. You it depends on how you know how much you're invested in nature and how much you can get into it and have a look and. Um, you know, there's new species being discovered all the time, the, particularly beetles, you know. Um, so there we go. Has anyone got any questions? I'll tell you what, if you think of a few questions for you, I'll show you a couple of things now. Um, somebody was asking me the other night about, uh, oh, um, funny enough, I think we've been censored, by the way, by YouTube. Um, a chunk of my our live discussion the other night is missing. And um, I haven't done anything to it. And it's, it's a particular sentence. I'm a bit, bit uh, interested and amused by it. And it had something to do with this man and it had something to do with Islam. So I'm, I'm kind of curious to see if I have been censored or if it's just some kind of technical blip. But uh, this is the, the, the biography of Richard Burton that I was telling you about, which is fantastic. It's called The Devil Drives. And um, yeah, uh, uh, absolute cracker of a book. And we were talking a wee bit about his, you know, talking a bit about him yesterday. There's his mausoleum, for example, that you can see if you're on the train at Mordrick. Um, and this is the disguise he undertook to. There's actually a quite a famous color painting of this, you know. So we were having a wee chat about him, and I thought that was interesting. But I was going to show you this book, but also very quickly, um, we were talking about Robert Heinlein, and I thought I'd grab a few. Um, John, we were talking, I think yesterday, people were always discussing about whether Robert Heinlein's a fascist, and we were, you know, finding that. But it was just about Heinlein's books, and I, I just kind of, in terms of the ones um, that I've read, I think Num Number of the Beast is super cookie and worth it just to read a book about pan dimensional multi person solipsism because <laughs> I can't think of any other book about it. But we've got a couple of um, ones that I have read, I will tell you, I've read Friday, um, and I really love Friday. I think it's a great book. Um, I'll not spoil it at all, but if uh, good Heinlein Fridays are worth a watch, um, uh, Double Star is pretty well regarded. Let me see. Uh, and I haven't read these, but I'm looking forward to it. And again, I think these are quite well known is The Assignment and Eternity Stories, uh, Volume 1 and Volume 2 in this wee book. Um, most of Heinlein's books are pretty chunky, by the way. And I still haven't read this one. And, and I think this is the one out of all of these sort of quite chunky ones that I haven't got around. Right which is I Will Fear No Evil. And I, I think this was made into a film with Steve Martin and Lee Tomlin. I think it's called All of Me. It's a comedy. Uh, but a, a man's mind going into a woman's body. So one, one of the, again, Heinlein's fun, um, I think. The, the Number of the Beast, by the way, is a very difficult read, I think. But what he's doing, the, the idea with pan-dimensional multi-person solipsism 
is that uh, it's a collection of a bunch of really insufferable PhD people. Um, they just they build a kind of dimensional time machine, and it's called the Gay Deceiver, if I can remember correctly. Uh, and what they realize is that every universe that if they that they've ever read about in books exists, and they can travel to it. So they go to places like Barsoom, Middle Earth. You know, all uh, they go to Iraq. I think they maybe no, they wouldn't go to Iraq. It's sorry, probably could have done but uh, you know a lot of these famous places uh they go to Mon you know visit flash gordon on mongo um it's called the number of the beast by the way because at one point they realize that they've read the bible so everything in the bible must be real because it's, it's to do with salt the solipsism and therefore they realize that the devil's real and they, they set a trap for him but um th this book talks a lot about foxy noxy now helipelification which is is the habit of saying that things are worthless and um it's a frustrating book, but if you get through it, it's and it pays lip service to an awful lot of fantasy and science fiction worlds. But I wouldn't, I'd say it's certainly not an easy read. Um, and I, I struggled with it, but when I finished with it, I just thought that that was bizarre. Um, and the one that I mentioned that I hadn't read yet the other night uh, again, uh, Red Planet, I haven't got around to reading that. And I haven't got around to reading Tunnel in the Sky. Um, uh, I suppose the other one, I, I was just looking there, and I don't think I can see my... Um, I think I've, it looks like I've lost my copy of Stranger in a Strange Land, but the, the other really, I'd say Stranger in a Strange Land is his best book, but the one that I would consider a close second is this book, Time Enough for Love. Uh, and the, these are the Lazarus Long stories, and I, and I, I think this is a, an exceptionally good book. Um, I, yeah, I'm, you know something at, at the end of the day, I'm from Northern Ireland, so uh, it's a bit of a backward place. A lot of my Heinlein's ideas that I've been reading, and you know, I, I like to look at forward thinking ideas. Science fiction is a thing that presents that. And I, 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 I suppose if you don't know too much about someone, I always read his books and thoroughly enjoyed them. And I, I don't, I don't really buy into the, to the fascist thing. Um, in terms of uh, we were just mentioning Greek mythology and so on, and I kept going on about Homer. Um, I like that you read dead trees. <laughs> I do indeed. Well, I keep I try to keep them good. Um, I, I like to argue that they're still alive in some way. It's a good use for the tree, but I do like trees. Uh, if if you haven't heard of it, if you're studying Greek mythology, this is the other contemporary author to Homer, and it's called Hesiod. And his two books are quite interesting. Um, Theogony is a very good one, particularly for the Pandora myth. And um, Works and Days is advice to his brother on how to run your house, I suppose. So in that sense, it's actually a book about ecology, uh, which is the uh, the study of your household. Uh, so arguably the first book on ecology ever written. Uh, it's eight, that's eight, 800, roughly 800 BC. So that's Hesiod. If, you, if you're... If you're interested in kind of uh, a, 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 the theogony in particular, is a uh, genesis of the gods is really what that is. So it's, it's a creation myth of the gods, if you like, as opposed to the world. And it's worth a look. Um, uh, blah, 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 blah. There was one other, a couple of other things. Um, somebody had asked me a wee bit about, uh, yeah, Hesiod is brilliant, John. I love Hesiod. Uh, this is my copy of Korzybski's General Semantics uh, seminars from 1937. Uh, and this is the Olivet College Lectures, um, third edition for this one. So, uh, you can see <laughs> I've gone well through. So this is this is the book that was a this stuff's a big influence on. Somebody was saying they had a much chunkier book, but uh, that's what I have. Um, that's big influence for the voice in particular. And um, this is Sears' book, uh, Where There Is Life. Uh, the other one is Deserts on the March. So that this is really where Herbert gets. And as you can, sorry. As you can see, it is an introduction to ecology. So a bit June's considered to be a, an ecological primer too. And this is this is this writer in particular uh, is the main ecological influence on on Frank Herbert. Um, yeah, and I, I read this stuff. It's it's uh, I'll, I'll read almost anything to be honest with you. It's, it's quite good. Um, I think I told you a wee bit of a misnomer actually about myself the other day. I said that I read only ancient stuff and science fiction pretty much um said that i didn't read much stuff before 10 60 60 
I suppose I do apologize. It's just a kind of stylization that I would would say to people, just because they tend to ask me about books that I'm not interested in. But I, I do read sort of um, epics and sagas and things like like uh, Chaucer and you know the, the Middle English period literature. And, um, but I, I would also read a fair bit of counterculture stuff and um, beatnik uh, that kind of literature. And I, I do sort of dabble around a bit, and um, I suppose, I, so I'm, I'm not that kind of narrow focused, if you know what I mean. This is Herbert's first book on the, the dragon in the sea. And uh, uh, if you have a read of this, I think if you want, somebody was talking about uh, tension. Um, uh, it, 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 he's right, it should, the best name for this book is Under Pressure. Uh, and it is an absolute cracker of a book. Um, pressure is, there's no chapters in it. it. The pressure builds and builds and builds. And if you have a look at the scene where the, the, the launch of the submarine, it, it's very similar to the birth, the rebirth of Paul Moody as it be, becomes Moody from the um, the still tent. But um, if you're a Frank, Frank Herbert fan, some of his books you, you may not like, but if you enjoy a good book, the, this is a, a cracker. It's um, a, a genuinely, um, I actually think, uh, I, I would be hard pressed to say it, but I think it's better than June. And, and I don't mean that in terms of, I just mean in terms of his writing. Uh, and and the, I think the story that he's come up with is real. It's, it's a really tight, it's not it's not an epic, massive book, though. So it's hard to compare them. But I, I think it's his, after June, it's his best piece of writing. And I, I've read this two or three times and really enjoyed it. And it fits nicely in with that uh, little canon of science fiction submarine literature, like things like, on excuse me, On the Beach. Um, so one other, just a couple of other things, I'm just as I'm showing you a few things, uh, excuse me, um, I couldn't remember the, the, the author's name, but uh, we have it here. So it's Kazuyo Koeki and Buseki Kojima. And this is the other thing, not really on the science fiction list, but uh, this is Lone Wolf and Cub. And if, if you haven't read this, there's, it's a 28 volume masterpiece. Um, and I've actually dissent to people that uh, my early life is I'm the baby in that card. And I don't, I don't, I'm not going to go into any more details about that, but uh, it's, there's a truth to it. If you haven't read this, um, I, I don't know what what this is thought of in Japan. I think it's considered very well, but th this is a this is a cultural artifact. Um, I, I, I'd say it's better than Shakespeare. Um, really brilliant. Uh, they're, they're very thick books. If you ever get a chance. Uh, like June, it's uh, the detail to Edo period Japan, the glossaries, etc. But these are wee comic books, manga, and um, the you know, each one. I have I have these old ones, and I, I lent some of them sadly to somebody else and never got them back. But each of these is about three hundred pages long. Um, if you uh, epic and um, wow, just just um, can't say much. Wow, W O W with a big exclamation mark. If you haven't read it, and you like that kind of thing. Sort of, sort of based on a approach to a true story. Uh, this is me, Michael Murcock, behold the man that he signed. Um, we got off topic there. There we go. And he signed it twice because he made a bit of a faux pas. So uh, he was badly jet lagged. <laughs> and did it again for me. And he was really nice. Uh, I got a call, another book off him too. But um, uh, this is, I think this was an American 30th. 30th anniversary edition, and it again has some nice illustrations and so on. And I, I've never had a sort of copy of this book. It's again one of those ones that I found on the carousel. Very controversial book, excellent, very good, uh, one of the best time travel books. And uh, the other thing just was on the, the, this is a kind of you can find these in second hand bookshops, but they're not easy to get. It's called Science Fiction Contemporary Mythology. And, uh, as we said, that there's a massive relationship between science fiction and uh, Contemporary uh, uh, mythology of all kinds, I think, and it's produced by the science fiction the SFWA, SFRA, and it's uh, an, an anthology of um, all sorts of things. If you're a science fiction, but just you know, uh, articles and papers by uh, you know academics and famous writers. So it was just to show you a few wee things. Um, there we go on our on our book list, and um, I suppose the other one only was if you're if you're interested in the classical world and you wanted a one book does all uh the world of athens look at how dirty my book is um <laughs> uh, that's that's how uh you can um the books that i've read most are absolutely saturated in common uh, and coffee uh unfortunately uh, i tend to be quite 
a bit of a spiller. <laughs> but yeah, but I, I mean, if you know, you can tell a book if I've worked with it, if it's covered in old coffee stains, which that is. It's a very good book. So there we go, folks. It's just a, a wee bit of a chat about some of those books that we were talking about the other day. Um, has anyone got any questions for me? <coughs> Excuse me, fire away. Hesiod, or John and uh, Babs and anybody who's still there is a very quick read, by the way. It's a, it's a nice, thin little book. Um, just be not the sort of thing you can usually find in, in um, most bookshops, I suppose. But it's it's not difficult to get. Um, you know, you can order a lot of the a lot of these classics easily online. Uh, but it's a very, very good read. <laughs> I'm going to get a wee quick sip. If anybody got any questions for me at all? And I suppose again with tonight's looking separating out the Xian technology, we're going to go into the Trilaxu technology. Um, I think in the next episode, and uh, then I think just after that, we we we, we look at a, a few evolutions specifically of I think their technology, the Golas and um, uh, do, 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 I think artificial melange, and I think the axolotl tanks is in the episode after that. That was the other thing I was thinking. Uh, somebody was asking me the other day if I had read um, Starship Stormtroopers, the article by Michael Murcock. So I, I did manage to get a hold of it and had a, had a wee nosy. I'm not too sure who was asking me that, if, if they're about. But um, it was quite an interesting read. It is, it's up there on, on the internet. Um, Starship Stormtroopers. I, I thought it was quite funny, actually. Uh, uh, it reads like a reads like quite a childish rant. Um, so I was actually quite surprised. Pardon me at the, at the tone from Michael Murcock there, but also I have a wee bit of I think uh, I have a wee bit of thoughts on that in, in terms of where he's at in his life and what's going on in Britain. And uh, it, it's also certainly an attempt to to kind of really push the new wave and 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 uh, dish the old. I feel like oh, the, the the golden age science fiction stuff, you know. Hmm. But yeah, it's an interesting article. What a maker. I was going to talk about that as well, I suppose. Um, I think I might have mentioned it already, but uh, the idea of um, little makers, great makers, and so on, and... Um, making uh really to do with poetry and um was, i think i was mentioning this well we've got uh, the poet of june that, the maker of june here Ooh. there we go insights maker of june insights of a master of science fiction this is edited by uh timothy o'reilly i believe uh, isn't it ah, there it is timothy o'reilly of uh the Java O'Reilly books, the O'Reilly computer textbooks, and so on. And um, yeah, this has got stuff like correspondence from from John Campbell and things like that in it. Uh, this is the definitive guide to life work of science fiction's grandest creator. It says on the on the book, uh, and it's well worth a wee look. Um, Timothy Timothy O'Reilly's got another a book. You probably probably some of us know this on Frank Herbert. Um, I think you can get it free online. I think it's. Uh, so again, a lot of the stuff would have been, you know, source material. There's there's stuff in here about his childhood, um, and as well worth a look. But the, the the word maker, you know, if you want, you can exchange that out in Greek and write the poet of June. Little maker would mean little poet. Great maker would mean great poet. So a poet is to make, and and there, there is something about that that, that, that that there's some there's some sort of connection there, I think, with Frank and, and that, and. Um, in a sense, if you know that Shakespeare is the bard, then Homer, but that, that's fine, but Homer is the poet. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wee sort of joke. Um, I think it's a classicist joke generally towards literacists, uh, if you like. So there we go. Well, um, it's 2342 GMT here. Um, has anyone got any other wee questions for me tonight? Um, I'm not too sure. I don't think we have too many people here, but uh, I'm delighted to answer um, all things science fiction or 
or June or, or anything on the Exians or anything like that, fire away, folks, if you've got something for me. But otherwise, if that's the case, I don't want to bore you guys too much. I know doing this every night, right? Uh, it's possible that we could run out of steam. But um, I, I don't think it, it's easy to run out of steam when talking about uh, talking about June. So there's that many topics. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, folks, I've not really got much. I don't think there's anything coming through here. So thank you very much for your time. I'm sure we've, we've answered this one all, that, all out. And um, I'll see you all tomorrow. We'll, we'll be back tomorrow um, with a, a look at the Exians at 10 o'clock. Oh, sorry, not the Exians. Um, the Tylaxu, the evolution of Tylaxu technology. And um, I think I think the Tylaxu technology takes us into quite the, the dark and dirty side of the of the June universe. As the Tylaxu would wish, the vile Tylaxu, the dirty Tylaxu. So I'll let you all head on, folks. And thank you very much for, for uh, joining me this evening. And um, we'll be back tomorrow, uh, tomorrow night after after the 10 o'clock episode. Uh, and I hope you join me for some questions and answers. Um, so in the meantime, have a good one and take care of yourselves. All the very best. And good night. <laughs>